celebratory too. We're celebrating a lifelong lived, uh, spanned multiple generations. Tommy Heinsohn passed away yesterday and that was uh, Tuesday. So I wanted to get these two gentlemen together to give their thoughts and, and we'll start with Bob Ryan. It's the length and the scope of it. And, and, and he is has a unique role in Celtic history in terms of longevity and no one else has had this particular uh, link of player, coach, broadcaster, and, you know, icon to a new generations that have never seen a hook shot. I was <laughs> you know, prepared. Uh, I was aware that he was in very bad shape and probably wasn't going to make it. So it was a matter of the, the inevitable news coming, you know, so it, it wasn't like it was out of nowhere in terms of reaction, you know, I said, mm -hmm. oh, okay, here it is. And I've, I've had a lot of time to get my thoughts together, frankly, in anticipation of, of uh, Tommy's death. Um, Look, it meant a lot to me. It's very personal. Uh, uh, we, you know, we started as rookies <laughs> in 1969. I was a rookie, 23 year old kid, uh, handed the Celtic beat two days before opening night. I mean, uh, that's a whole other story itself. He was the rookie coach uh, of a team that was trying to get itself together after the greatest player in its history had retired the previous spring, Bill Russell, as well as Sam Jones. This is the hand he was dealt as a new coach. Now he's coaching some guys he had been teammates with, which is always dicey. I want Max to address what that might be like. Um, Tommy, I mean, John Havlicek, Don Nelson, Satch Sanders were all teammates. Larry Siegfried was on that team, teammate. And no, he wouldn't play. He didn't play with Tommy. Anyway, so it was all new to him. And, and you know, we were feeling, a, uh, uh, so I had a relationship with him right from the start uh, and that I needed. I needed to learn the NBA. I thought I knew something about basketball, but I was more of a college guy. So anyway, so I spent a lot of time with Tom Heinz, a lot of cups of coffee, a lot of a lot of stories. And, and as he taught me the what the NBA was all about, as opposed to what the college basketball world I knew was all about. Well, um, I probably not not prepared for it as much, although I knew Tommy was sick and I knew Tommy was in bad shape. It was just like when they said to me, maybe it was almost two and a half, three months ago, that they were sending Tommy Heinsohn home and he was going into hospice. So you look that it was any day now that Tommy Heinsohn was going to pass away. Next thing I know, I'm hearing Mike Gorman holding conversations with Tommy. He's eating, he's doing this. So it was almost like, I, I knew it was coming, but I didn't know it was coming. Um, as a player, I had him my rookie year, and that was his last year coaching. Bob would remember this. Uh, it was kind of revolt against Tommy at the end with some of his players like JoJo and Sydney, and, uh, you know, those guys I think kind of wanted him out. So I think Tommy had my first year I had – probably about 18 games with Tommy Heinsohn. And um, what I remember most about that was he would take a Cedric Maxwell to the side after practice, keep me there, put uh, a, uh, a guard on the rim where the ball can't go through. And all I was going to do was just have a box out drill. And, you know, any like the last two or three guys who were left, uh, Boswell and I had to box those guys out and <laughs> that was I mean it it, it it was taxing but I learned he told me he said you're not going to out jump guys in this league you're gonna have to be smarter quicker and and your mind has to be sharp enough to, to box guys out so he taught me some valuable lessons by myself as a basketball player I find that very interesting Max because I uh, like to tell people they don't understand this, the, the technique, the technical side of him. I'll tell you a guy whose career he, he didn't make, but he enhanced. He made him better. Individual instruction. Don Chaney. Don Chaney couldn't shoot worth a shit when he started, all right? And, and, he, and he, he, he drifted, and, and his technique was awful. Tommy worked with him individually after practice, to the point where Don Chaney in 1972-73 averaged 13 points a game. Some of that was fast break layoffs, but the fact is he started making jump shots, and and, and he owes that all. Tommy Heinsohn was his, his technical 
a coach. Uh, so I mean, he, he obviously his basketball mind was extraordinary. It was it was the, the technique. I remember him telling me about all this. I mean, techniques about offensive rebounding that he had, and and he was a man. He was very proud of that, yeah. Max. I I bet he passed that on to you guys. Oh, too. he passed those kind of lessons on Bob. He'd have these drills where he'd be talking about a two on one fast break, three on one, four on one, five. We're gonna even six on one. I'm like, damn, the only five guys on the floor. How do you get the six? Well, this guy comes back around and oh. comes back through the play yep. and showed how to fast break. He felt like his teams were going to get easy baskets. And that's how they beat Kareem and Oscar Robinson, essentially just running them out the gym. They never took their foot away from any part of their body. They kept their boot right in their butt the whole time never let you take a breath. And that's what they did. Uh, he was just, he, he would, there were so many things. And Bob, like, like you, what I remember about Tommy Heinsohn was just the mental games he played with you as a friend or whoever he was and just challenge you. Uh, one thing he said to me one time, he says, uh, this is when he was broadcast broadcaster. And I, maybe I was in my fourth or fifth year as a broadcaster. He said, in front of a crowd of people, he turns to me and says, why do black people always vote Democratic? And I looked at him like, Mr. White Man, what the hell are you damn talking about? But you got it, away with it. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was more to see how I was going to react than, the, than anything else. The pressure he would put you on in those places, he wanted to see. It was almost like you were a rat in a maze and he, you were, he was experimenting with your mind. Yeah, Bob, yeah. Uh, one of you guys, one of you guys are uh, Max. You mentioned Kareem. I think of the hook shot. This is an interesting group of people here because you got Bob, who's right from the beginning, from the media standpoint. You got Max, player, media, and all, all that. And then you got me. I'm just kind of the fan, right? So I grew up listening to Tommy. I mean, he obviously spoke the game to the fans, uh, but. I never knew until like, remember they used to do those classic all-star games with the classic players. I think somebody blew out their knee and they stopped doing it. Yeah. Remember Bob? And Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. They were uh, great. Uh, that was my favorite part of all-star weekend, like Redwood coach, you know? So uh, Tommy does this hook shot from like the corner three. And I'm like, I thought only Kareem shot hook shots and then you know the broadcasters bad it was rick barry or somebody said you know he invented the hook shot was tommy heinson and and talk to that a little bit well he perfected it he didn't invent perfected it, but he, it yeah. he perfected it and the difference was he was a college center at holy cross he was six seven he was a classic 50s oriented college center which means hook shot was part of the deal mm -hmm. i mean if you, you couldn't be a center in the 50s in the 60s if you didn't have a hook shot that was part of the deal and then but when he got to the nba he's now a forward and he's not posting up that much and they got a center name was russell <laughs> and so uh tommy dunn expanded to the running hook and his patented shot and if they ever do the statue i hope to god that someday they do at uh, the, the garden it's got to be the running hook and he from the corner i mean it's a no one does that today that's I'm preposterous you, you like get benched right? out. but that was his his go-to shot was a running hook from the corner then i remember and, years later they're closing the garden and he faked the hook when they remember you guys did the pass of the ball and tommy faked a, a hook <laughs> passed it off to the next legend and uh people forget what a great player he was and you what know a great what? that that was that was a very unique moment in Celtic history. Oh, as that a fan, it was to talk about it, yeah. That particular line of people who were out there. And what I remember so well was the fact how Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen were all teasing me, saying, what the hell are you doing out there in the middle of the <laughs> <laughs> oh, It was great. <laughs> and it was just... It was just funny because you, you it was like Coos had it and, the, and then it I went know. around and it got to Tommy, he faked the hook and then went to Jojo, Jojo passed it to me. And it, was, it then finally got to Larry at the end where Larry put the basket, he put it in the, um, the hoop. And it was just, a, it was a surreal thing to be out there with so many great players in that situation. 
that it, it was uh, it, it was mind blowing. Man, was one, you know, figure out, I mean, t- Max, we've all seen this over the years. Tommy demonstrating that hook with a sport coat and dress shoes before a game <laughs> for whatever reason, for fun. Yeah, I mean, he, it was like it was just so much a part of his identity was the hook. And he did a book with Leonard Lewin of the New York Post uh, at, at one point. You know what the title of the book was? Give him the hook. I could, it's right on the bookshelf behind me. I should have held it up and, but give him the hook. He was, a, he just identified so much uh, as a player with, with that hook shot. Well, I think Bob, you're right. And, and I'll go just like you did. And I asked this today when I was on the sports hub, the radio, I said, I am not sure if Tommy Heinsohn isn't the most beloved Celtic ever. And when I, I think, think so. about that, just the generations that he covered, yeah. going from as a player to a coach to a broadcaster, you would go someplace and I would be with Tommy and I might think I was big shit, but they all like, yo, that's Max right there. But that, <laughs> that's Tommy Heinsohn right there. And, <laughs> and then I love the way he used to say it too, because he would, he would put down these stories that would just almost captivate you. Because he'd talk about how the guy Dave Zinkoff would say his name. He said, that's not my name, Tommy Heinsohn. It's Tommy <laughs> Heinsohn. And he said, <laughs> he said, the only person who would say that the right way was the guy in Philadelphia when he would announce him coming into a game. So he just had stories about money, about buildings, oh. about being dropped off in a cornfield at Fort Wayne and getting off a train and the kids had to come pick him up and they would take you back in for a dollar or whatever it was. The stories were just fascinating about the early NBA. Oh, I love you brought up the Fort Wayne thing because I, I've heard those Fort Wayne stories. Uh, 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 and there was a special place they went, a, a cafe or some blue parrot, red parrot, I don't know, something, you know, but they got, yeah, they got dropped off and then they had to get a bus. I mean, it's the NBA, uh, but I, I loved hearing all those stories naturally and the stories about the Celtics and, and, and the individual guys on the team, uh, uh, Bill Sharman, who was so meticulous, you know, I heard all these stories and he said he was the best athlete of all of them. I heard, I mean, I, I just filed this away. It was, it was a tutorial, it was a clinic. I, I, I learned so much. You know, the thing that he never really talked about and I wish I had picked his brain about. Oh, I know where you're going, he, I hope, go ahead. He, he, ne- he never talked about the social issues. Yes. He never talked about, you know, places that he went. I heard Bob Cousy talk about when Russell didn't get a chance to eat. I did the interview um, with Sam Jones where he talked about they were in St. Louis and he went to a place and Sam said, I'm the fastest one. So I was the first one in line at this cafe and I got to the top of the register and the lady said, so I'm sorry, sir, but we can't serve you. And he talked about how his teammates went, you know, essentially went hungry that day and didn't eat because of that. But I never heard Tommy talk about those situations with Russell and, and all those guys when, cause you know, back there in the fifties, when he started, it really had to be something when it think about race relations and places that black people couldn't go or black players couldn't go. No, uh, you're right. I, I don't have, I can't verify. I mean, I, I can verify that. I don't know, no, I haven't talked much about that. But what I do know is that his, his black teammates all mm. loved and respected him. Russell was out there yesterday tweeting, oh. tweeting. And, and so obviously he was, he was there for them. I mean, it's clearly, I mean, I, I don't think that anybody's putting on an act at all. You know? Well, no. you know, it was a, it? there were two names. They called him Heine was one. Right. But then the other one they called him, which I had to understand was Hawk. Hawk, yes. It's what, I- it, it's what uh, Jojo and Cowan's and that particular era. It was like a and, tomahawk, right? Yeah, that's what, no, I'm not sure what it about tomahawk. It was something to do with hawk. And I don't know what it was, but that's what they called I him. I never asked. I just took it you know, in. And they did call him hawk. And uh, one of my favorite stories, and this is a Tommy story and it's Havlicek story in combined, OK? Um, Havlicek told me that one day Tommy took him aside and s- talked about Bill Bradley. And he said, hey, hey John, the next time he puts both hands on your hips. I want you to take the ball and smash it in his face. <laughs> and John said, but Hawk, he doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> <laughs> but Hawk, I know that, that thing was, but Hawk, 
And you're right. That was a, a little known nickname outside the, uh, the world, the little fraternity that people didn't know him for, uh, as. But right inside the group, he was hot. I had my, my first encounter um, with both Red and Tommy was my rookie year. I came to Boston in 1977, getting drafted by the Celtics. I come up here to visit. Uh, my attorney's supposed to be with me. And he somehow, I reach out to him. And he's not here. He said, go to the garden, go to see Red. Up. So I get in the cab. I don't have much money. And I'm thinking Logan was, you know, $30 cab ride. It was $4 <laughs> or whatever back then. So I get to the garden, look at this barn. This guy said, the garden's right. I was like, what? And finally, I find my way to the Celtic office, see the secretary. And she's like, tell her who I was. And, she says, uh, Mr. Arbach and Heinsohn and Coach Heinsohn are, are in, the, in the office. You can go in. And they are laughing like hell, you know, before I get in. Like, just, you can hear red, uh, 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 but then you hear Tommy's voice, uh, 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 a big, you know, barrel voice coming out. I walk through the door. As soon as I walk in, they get, it gets dead silence. They don't say another word. <laughs> I'm like, holy Shit. What am I going to do now? My little rookie self and I got two legends, not one. I got two legends in front of me and, and I'm trying to compose myself, but I will always remember that particular thing that happened to me. My favorite Tommy stuff is the, the national broadcast as a fan, as a kid growing up, trying to listen to Tommy on CBS, not be biased was outstanding. I mean, it was just the best. And then he's with Dick Stockton who was in, outwardly obvious uh, 76ers fan. I mean, he had to be. Growing up, we'd be like, these two would be arguing. Tommy would try so hard not to be biased. And, and uh, eventually, I think Cunningham replaced him. And it was never the same on CBS because Tommy was so entertaining and, and charismatic. What's his lasting memory going to be? Does he get a statue? I mean, Johnny Most has the microphone at the garden. Bob, what's befitting of a guy like Tommy Heinz in six, seven decades? I mean, it's a long time. He is Mr. Celtic above all, all the players, all of them. You know, I, uh, uh, he, he's no association with any other team. Like, who's he coached another team? Bird mm -hmm. coached another team. Um, you know, other, th they, but Tommy Heinsohn was the Celtic through and through. I, I tweeted and I mean it. Nobody bled green more than Tommy Heinsohn. I would, I'd recommend a statue. I'd recommend a statue of Tommy with that hook shot. I'm telling you, that's the thing. Um, yeah, I understand the current generation knows him as a broadcaster, but but uh, the foundation was the fact that he was a great player. He's a Hall of Fame player. There are four people, three of them who had an NBA association, who are uh, in the Hall of Fame as both a player and a coach. The fourth was a college uh, guy. And um, so uh, Tommy, Len Lenny Wilkins, and Bill Sharman, a teammate of his. Yeah, that's a nice company. And uh, that, that's an incredible tribute, I think, a person like that. Now, both papers... Have, have done their job okay, for people go buy a paper you don't want to just settle mm. for this today people okay yeah, this is not the way you want to commemorate it, tommy heinsohn is on the hand, palm of your hand buy the damn paper buy the globe <laughs> and buy the herald and put them away because they're keepsakes both of them great job I, I i love it uh bob occasionally you know if you were a celtic broadcaster you would get a little call from the office uh, about something you might have said about one of the players. And uh, so you get a little, so it was one day I um, got a call from EEI and they were telling me about something, but they said, by the way, the Celtics, you said something about, I said, who, who do I need to talk to? You know, so it's Rich Gotham. And so I called Rich Gotham, the president of the Celtics. And he says, um, I said, you know, I said, hi. He said, well, Max, you know, you said something the other day that, uh, I said, 90% of the things I say about the Celtics are, you know, 95% are always positive. You know, there's some things that, you know, well, well, why can't we, we want you to be more like Tommy. And I said, look, I'd have to be the incredible Hulk to have that much green if I'm going to be like damn Tommy. <laughs> nobody bled green like Tommy. So I, I, I was almost like, I said, nobody can be like Tommy. A broadcaster today can't be like Tommy Heinsohn for any team right now because you're too much of a homer. You're too much on the other side. And uh, things he said that, uh, you know, I laugh about, 
that uh, only Tommy could get away with. Right. I mean, it was after my <laughs> Violet Palmer comment where I was talking about <laughs> Tommy Heinsohn. I was I was mimicking him when I was like, ah, go get me some a, a bacon and eggs. I was talking <laughs> like Tommy, and, and, and nobody got that. So I was like, I ended up having to apologize or whatever. But telling this story because two weeks later there's a game against the Houston Rockets, and Yao Ming was there. And they throw Yao Ming a pass, and it goes out of his hand. And Tommy says, ah, he didn't catch that ball because of those chopstick fingers. Oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Chopstick uh -oh. fingers? <laughs> and, and you tell me about what I said? <laughs> so, I mean, Tommy Heinsohn could kind of get away with anything as a broadcaster for the Celtics. Yeah. You know, okay. I, it was. He, right, he had that niche, and he got that aura, and he, and he established it, and, and, and everybody knew it. But I'm going to remember him uh, as being an incredibly intelligent man. And, of yeah, course, yeah. we got to talk about the painting. We have to talk mm -hmm. about that, uh, that side of him, the artist. I remember the first time I found out about this, guys, um, was in, in a, a little thing in Sport Magazine when he was still with the, uh, with the Celtics. And it had a little <laughs> item called Sport Card, uh, Score Card. You know, and it talked about how Tommy Heinsohn of the Celtics is an accomplished a drawer. They talk about his drawings. This is before we got into full scale art. And that's what the first time I found out about it. People have to know, he's a legitimate artist. We're not talking about the stick figures. We're talking about the man did portraits. The man was very noted for his landscapes. He used to take vacations and international vacations and take his art, his palette and, and go and, and find new subjects to, to paint. Whether it's Paris, London, Rome, whatever, he would. That's one of the things he would do in, in the off season. Oh, he was a, a so he's a very accomplished uh, artist. Uh, you know, wonderful side of him. I have a Hein. We have a Heinsohn in our living room. You know, I'm very I've proud of. That. Uh, and really that's something uh, that. I have a I have a picture uh, around here someplace, and, and I was telling Nick I have to find it. But it was a piece of it was a drawing, and it was of myself, Kevin McHale. Robert Parrish um, and Larry Bird, that he did a art graphic of the four of us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he wrote up there to me something like, you know, when, at, when you need to be at your best, you can be at your best. Something like that. It was almost like backhanded, like, well, we know you don't play hard all the time, but when <laughs> they needed you, you know, you were there to do what you need to do. But, uh, he was, that was another side because he would go and it was a popular way because Tommy was also very much about the ladies. So that was another way to draw women towards him when he was out on the street, the coolest thing in the world. You an artist, hey baby, let me take a, let me draw a picture of you. Come on here. <laughs> so, it was, it was just this unique thing. He had all these facets with him that were so great, even to the point where he used to tell you, Bob, I'm sure he told you a thousand times how he didn't make that much money. So that's why he started an insurance company over in Worcester. And, oh, yeah. And how, because, you know, he didn't make all that money during that time. Oh, when he retired, he, he was an insurance salesman. And he also, the Celtics started up broadcasts right away. And he, he, he worked with Red on Channel 56. That is crazy. And he I did play-by-play. Play, and I could still hear Red. He's walking. He's walking. <laughs> that had I mean, to be the most biased. To Tommy was the, <laughs> the stabilizing force. How's that? <laughs> oh, my God. Where can we find that footage? Tommy I mean, had the re rain wet Red in. I'm not they kidding. The Celtics have to release that footage from the vault because I remember as a kid they put once in a while Koozie and and uh, and and Tommy together and Tommy oh, yeah. would have to do play by play and it yep. was like cluttered and clustered. I can't imagine the homerism with Red. No, you and, can't. You oh really can't. My it was God. Really but that was a full time job. The insurance until sixty nine. The broadcasting it was during seasonal for him. You know, which was but was first fine. And, but that's what he did. And apparently he was an award-winning champion salesman. You know, yeah. he was, he was like the star of the team of the, of the insurance company. So, but cause he was a bright guy. I mean, there's no question. He's a very bright man. One of my memories, I wish, oh God, I, 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 I don't know if they got it vaults, but you used to have this, Max remembers the uh, 
kickoff dinner every year. Tip off dinner was at the Benet Brith, the Benet Brith. And I get back. <laughs> and at one of them, Tommy Heinsohn gave a speech about what it meant to him to be a Celtic. That was almost brought tears to your eyes. It was so profound and so heart uh, wrenching, you know, and just so uh, passionate. Uh, and he articulated it in a way uh, or that, uh, you know, you couldn't do better. It meant, it, it wasn't, a, it truly meant something to him. And and uh, I wish I had, you know, I remember I wrote a column about it. If I, if I find a column, I could get some of the quotes, but but uh, he, he was capable of, of really great oratory, believe me. And you mentioned that the, we talk a lot about the painting. I did not know that he was such a big Winston Churchill fan who was also a huge painter. You know, so yeah. that 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 shows to it was beyond basketball, and he touched everybody. And guys, I can't Tommy, thank you. Yeah. Tommy was Tommy was layers. He was uh, <laughs> like you couldn't get Tommy in one page. He was layers. It was page after page, and you turn <laughs> another page, you're going, "Wow, I didn't know this," or or didn't he? Or he or people he met, or Sinatra, or this. It was just like layers upon layers of our history, which are now gone that, you know, hopefully some of it will be brought back by us. But I, yeah. I think if we had, if you had, you know, a thousand people in the room, we were all talking about Tommy, that would still be tons and tons of stuff that people didn't know. And you know how much he loved Helen, you know, his wife, Helen. Oh my God, he oh. about, he'd always said, yeah, well, I got to do it. The redhead wants me to do it and <laughs> about her all the time. And, and then to see that when she got, she had cancer, and Tommy at that time went cold turkey and never smoked again. After mm -hmm. all those years of yeah, 40, 50 years of smoking, Tommy just stopped on a dime and never really smoked again. And uh, that was a testament to him as a, as a man and how that he could will himself to do things. People talk about Donald Trump's will to do things. Tommy... Will would have just blasted anything that President Trump even thought about because Tommy would will things. Will you? He, even guys who couldn't really play that well because there were Celtics, Tommy saw good things in them. I, I was like, that dude can't play. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. He can do this, he can do that, he can do this. He can. I'm like, well, I'm looking at him, but he would, he would will a guy. It's like, you think about it. Juan McCarty wasn't a great player. Mm -hmm. But after you thought about it, when he said, I love Walter. Walter. And, and when he said that, everybody would just go on and on. Like Walter was like the salt of the earth. So, you know, it was just, it was just unique. And, and I had, I think I had one, one difference about it. He and I were talking, and that's when I said that I was on the air and I said, Kevin Garnett might be the greatest all-around Celtic. And that's combining defense and offense. And it got to be, I once it was game five or six, and he said, yeah, you said that, but your boy ain't really did anything. And that's when Kevin had this unbelievable game and went to another level. So Tommy had this belief that, you know, you had to either put up or shut up. It was Look his Kyrie. play I mean, or the damn highway. That's yeah. how it was. He, he blasted Kyrie. You rarely heard, you know, Kyrie, Kyrie come right out. Remember, and said Tommy must be watching the games. But he blasted Kyrie. He had balls of steel, man. Nobody nobody contested him. And and then you look at some of the tweets that went around yesterday. Isaiah Thomas, he said, I was blessed to be called the little guy by him. And you mentioned Walter and the Tommy point. You mentioned the Max about uh, the underdog, right? He rooted for the underdog. I did not know the origin of the Tommy point was for those who were at not necessarily at the top of the box score, but made yeah. the, the win, you know, and this is, right. he said he learned that from Red. And that's the other thing too. He carried on that tradition of, of Red Auerbach. You felt Red around him when he was oh, there, yeah. at least as a fan. So yeah. he's, he's surely going to be missed. And yeah, now it's up yeah. to you guys hold the, 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 the you torch, all that, you guys. That is, that is so true. That is, I think, what you will miss because he was... I want to say he's probably, Bob, I probably have to say he's the last touch to, uh, you know, anything. That was there all the time. Really. Yeah. You, you yeah. Think about those guys because it was Jojo and Havlicek and all, and then it was Tommy who 
was around for all the championships. So mm -hmm. he read, read our back better than anybody. So I, I think that's true. I think that's the last linchpin right now to who read our back really was. Hopefully they're up there smoking a cigar, at least lighting one up, up in heaven, basketball gods and everything else. So, uh, guys, this was an honor to sit with you and talk about a living legend with two living or a passing legend with two living legends. And God bless Tommy. Rest in peace. And uh, I think he'd want you all out. Go out and get a Tommy point. So let's go do it. <laughs> <laughs>